Emily is the director and principal lawyer at Comha Group on Australia. Um, Comha Group. Um, Sorry, an Australian-based legal and policy advisory firm. She is a climate change and environmental law specialist with extensive experience in land use and development, environmental and social impact assessments, native title, environmental markets, climate resilience incentives, and renewables development projects. Emily comes very highly recommended. Um, I've heard her name dropped in multiple uh, occasions in multiple meetings and. Um, a number of people said uh, that they were very excited to see her come today. So, not to build you up too much, Emily, sorry. Um, she <laughs> plans to help explain what the role of carbon, what a carbon broker is, what happens in the event of a carbon deficit at the end of a contract, which is something I think we all need to understand, and the legalities around brokers, what to watch out for from a rangeland's perspective. So, Emily, I'll hand it over to you. you ha um, we're going to uh, try and wrap up at around 11.25 and, and have a break. No worries. I'll uh, try and multitask um, and get uh, get my slideshow up and running. Can you see that screen at, at your end? Hoping hoping that's a yes. <laughs> Interrupt me if you if you can't see my covering slide there. And and thanks for that. Um, very lovely in introduction. It's pleased to be with you virtually, similar to Dean. Um, our, our travel is uh, officially prevented from coming across at my home in Melbourne um, to you all in South Australia and Port Augusta. Um, but I'm, I'm looking forward to today's discussion. Carbon and climate change are among my favourite topics, so um, it'll be uh, a pleasure to keep discussing here and also on the panel with you. And, and I, I'm really looking forward to that because it's nice to hear um, about the issues and questions that you have um, that are relevant to you as well. Before I begin, um, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land on where you are and, and also um, to where I'm coming from you, um, coming to you from in Melbourne, um, and pay my respects to their elders past and present. Um, the Wurundjeri people here in Melbourne, I'm not far from the from the MCG where I where I am, and it, I hope it's not too early to mention football. Um, it's not far away, and the women's season, season's going well. Um, so I, I'm looking forward to today's discussion. As as mentioned, I'm going to cover a few things um, in this discussion, and then hopefully they will plant the plant the seeds. Pardon the pun for um, for some good discussion over the over the panel. Um, I wanted to to outline for you some of the context and legal framework um, that we'll go through, um, and also and and some of the key concepts under the Act, and then as as mentioned, role of broker and role of other other typical players that you might see in carbon project development. Um, if I keep looking to my left here, it's because I've got my slides that you can see um, on my screen to my left, so I'm not not gazing out the window. Um, although I could be, thoughtfully, I am if I look directly in front of me. Um, I want to leave you with a, with this relevant context because I think it's um, important. I, I think Dean's discussion was um, incredibly useful and it's always pleasing to hear about the innovation that's going on in this space, including in relation to um, the, the, the self-herding, um, the, the tech and, and management innovation going on in the agricultural sector at the moment is is wonderfully exciting. Um, and it's it's only going to continue to improve, and that's equally as exciting. Um, the legal framework tries to keep up with it. There are some clunky elements to it, and, and I think it goes without saying that the Clean Energy Regulator and others um, in Canberra and, and in the South Australian Government um, are working hard to create practical solutions as we, as we all um, evolve different methods and different ways of doing things and can prove the science um, both both Western and increasingly traditional owner science as well from up north and fire management, um, blending those things together to create um, and, and continue a scheme with good integrity. So I'll outline a little bit about how contracts work and some of the things to look out for, for in practice and also touch on co-benefits and how they're um, coming through in the markets and, and evolving as well. I would... Um, I would ask you to, to stop me as I go, but similarly to Dean, I think um, tech makes it tricky um, to ask questions as you go. So if you have got a pen and paper or a smartphone or something in your hands, please note 
questions down, I'm, I'm more than happy to come back to them uh, if time permits at the end or otherwise after, after the break when we, we have the panel session. Um, but to give you a little bit of general context, and I, I think it's important to touch on the international, I'm not going to stay there for too long, um, but it is, it is important to understand it as both a driver for carbon markets, but also a signal as to how things will evolve um, in Australia domestically. Um, so carbon markets uh, are broadly part of environmental markets and we're seeing um, greater convergence and almost interplay between environmental markets, which include things like water trading and biodiversity and native vegetation offsetting and those sorts of things. Um, we're seeing more and more interplay between carbon and biodiversity markets and the recent review of the federal uh, environmental law, the Environment Protection Biodiversity Conservation Act, which is certainly a mouthful, um, has recently been reviewed and the final report from the reviewer um, of, that, of that act notes the opportunities around leveraging carbon markets to really stimulate um, recovery of Australia's biodiversity. So there, there is this confluence um, that's increasing between environmental, you know, typically separate environmental markets and carbon markets and I think we'll continue to see some of those trends, but I'll, I'll come back to that at the end. Um, big picture, those of you in the room might have heard of, and I'm not going to spend too much time on it, the Kyoto Protocol um, at the international uh, level, and, and now it's, um, it, it's dropping away and the Paris Agreement, which was agreed in 2015, is, is coming on stream and, and taking operation. But essentially the Kyoto Protocol is important because it really set up um, carbon credit trading as we know it and, and set, set the example for how it can work and set, set up a number of standards and rules, you know, telephone books and telephone books if you, if you go back that long and remember the telephone books from the days of old, um, you know, reams and reams of paper if you printed them on, on how quantification of activities can lead to carbon credits and that's some of what Dean took you through in relation to a human-induced regeneration project. Um, the rules, the modelling, all of those details which get set out in, in regulatory frameworks, it's, it's a huge job. So a lot of, a lot of what we know and, and from, through learning by doing comes from that international framework and comes from the Kyoto Protocol. Um, for those of you that are interested in follow us, um, we, we at Comha do attend the international negotiations and assist at those and follow it very closely, in particular Article 6 which is the, the, the part of the Paris Agreement that deals with market mechanisms and trading, so the continuation of those carbon credit markets. Um, for those of you who are interested, there's still uh, outstanding discussion and negotiation on how the rules of the Paris Agreement will treat the transition across from the Kyoto Protocol. So there's a little bit of uncertainty there at, at the moment in the international realm, um, as well as industry who are moving um, and, and this is sort of for context and because it does affect markets and does affect future pricing and, and ways of delivering abatement and in incentivising things like carbon credit projects and carbon projects. <clears throat> shipping, so shipping and aviation are sort of outside the general framework for Kyoto and, and the Paris Agreement. And so those industry sectors and industry bodies at the international level are setting up their own frameworks um, and certainly aviation involves using offsetting and, and carbon credit units and they look at accrediting units that have high high credibility um, and, and looking at do no harm type tests. So really again looking at this positive angle of some of these projects where they're not harming the environment, they're not harming social and community um, communities in which they, they operate and, and they're not, you know, at the, at the huge scale internationally they're not resulting in human rights abuses and those sorts of things. So um, sectors and, and industry are looking at their own schemes and that's that's driving up demand for carbon credits um, and we'll come back to that later on as well. Locally, really important um, to be aware that in, a, in Australia, as Dean mentioned, the Carbon Credits Carbon Farming Initiative Act is the, is the national law that is, is key to carbon farming activities because it's the law that regulates the registration of carbon projects as well as their operation and when you get, when you can apply for and receive a carb, um, Australian carbon credit units or ACUs or what we'll call carbon credits in this context. Um, compliance with that Act and its requirements um, is important and it sets the details to ensure integrity 
of the scheme and system, um, including the, the scientific robustness of activities and methods that can be used to generate credits, like the human-induced regeneration method. Um, the Act also establishes what you what you might know as the Emissions Reduction Fund, and I think it's a really important point that sometimes gets lost, that the ERF or the Emissions Reduction Fund is exactly that, it's a fund. Um, it's a fund that's used by the Clean Energy Regulator to purchase carbon credits, um, and that fund is established by the by that CFI Act, the Carbon, Carbon Credits, Carbon Farming Initiative Act. Um, the Clean Energy Regulator is, is therefore, on behalf of the government, one of the main purchases of carbon credits at the moment in Australia and is therefore sort of on one level a very important customer, a very important buyer, and that's through the auctions um, that are conducted uh, a couple of times a year and, and even through COVID we're still, we're still conducted. So I think that's just a, a point that helping, helping separate some of these concepts that really the Carbon Farming Initiative Act is, is the details and the ins and outs of what you'll need to comply with uh, with the help of service providers and others in looking at projects the ERF itself is a fund that is used to purchase carbon credits should you want to sell them through that method, through that, that pathway. Um, the safeguard mechanism is um, basically sort of a, a capping of, of emissions that goes on in the, in the heavy emitter sector under the, the National Greenhouse um, and Energy Reporting System. So it's, it's a driver of what we call a compliance driver of purchasing of carbon credits because... In, in a nutshell, what that scheme does is it says certain high emitting facilities, so uh, power plants and other um, other emitting facilities, have a, a baseline that caps the number of that caps their emissions. And if they're going to go above their baseline, um, they can seek to uh, vary things or do various things to to uh, have temporary exemptions. But in a nutshell, they need to purchase carbon credit units at the moment um, and and retire them to bring themselves back essentially within their baseline. So there's some purchasing that's been going on under the safeguard mechanism, which I'll come back to. And last but certainly not least, um, local and state laws are incredibly important in looking at the carbon projects. Um, South Australia has policies and strategies which guide its effort and, and the government's effort to engage and move forward and, and the pastoral, um, pastoral act review is, is part of that as well as their sequestration strategy um, and, and those here in South Australia and also elsewhere um, know to move towards trying to maximise co-benefits, um, which I'll come back to as well. There is a need to comply with local laws, so it's not just all about that, that national law that I mentioned, the Carbon Farming Initiative Act. Um, there's a need to ensure that you comply with any town planning laws and, and permits, if you need water allocations, the Pastoral Land Management and Conservation Act requirements and processes, any other crown lease um, or licence terms and conditions that you might have, um, you need to ensure that you're complying with what you may need for your activity, um, as well as any conditions attaching to those instruments that you might hold for what you're doing already on properties. Um, in some circumstances, and this is really limited sort of more to forestry type activities um, in South Australia, but in other jurisdictions, there's a there's a need to create and, and hold a carbon right as well at a, at a state level. Um, in South Australia, as I said, it's a little bit more limited, um, looking at forest property agreements to create and transfer a carbon right. And really, that's evidence of a person's right to benefit from the carbon stored in forest vegetation. Um, so sometimes uh, that's an additional legal, legal mechanism that's required to demonstrate um, a proponent's legal right to carry out a project. So that's uh, that's a little bit of a, an overview. I, I know we're going through some some pretty meaty topics um, in a little bit of detail, but some of these were covered uh, by Dean, and I, I think it never never hurts to recap and, and have them repeated in in minds. But I, I do want to draw your attention to some really key concepts under the framework as a whole, and this is the national framework. And, and they're, they're terms that you'll hear thrown around, they're terms that you'll see if you research on, on the internet, they're terms you might be familiar with already in terms of looking at doing projects and speaking to people and, and engaging with um, both governments. So eligible offsets project, project proponent, agents, eligible interest holders, methods, crediting periods, permanence periods, reporting and auditing, relinquishment requirements and carbon and maintenance obligation. I've cherry-picked a few there. Um, there are a raft of other things under the Act to be cognizant of, but 
Um, these are these are some of the the, the high level ones. I'm going to um, go through some of these in more detail, but essentially the eligible offsets project is really making sure that what you want to do, the carbon project that you want to do, meets requirements of the Act and is therefore eligible. And, and you need to formally seek that declaration and meet the requirements of the Act um, when you go through to, to seek that. Um, it's important that before you take that step um, that you identify who is going to be the project proponent and I'll go into more detail about that shortly. Um, that can be yourselves as, as pastoral leaseholders or as owners or as other leaseholders of, of various properties, um, or you can actually convey that legal right to carry out a project to somebody else, um, and they would be the project proponent. In some circumstances, there's flexibility to have joint proponents as well. Um, so there's a little bit of a discussion that needs to happen around who is actually going to be the project proponent for a project and, and therefore legally responsible for it. Um, and also accountable for it as well. Methods, and, and I think um, Dean's touched on that one, so I won't go into too much detail about it, other than to note that there are specific methods or suites of activities that get approved through the scheme, and so you need to apply an approved method that's been t tested um, under the Act and considered to be sufficiently robust, and therefore um, activities that can be used to demonstrate the, the abatement of carbon or the storage of carbon and, and the basis on which to apply for carbon credits. Um, crediting periods are really the periods in which you can apply to receive carbon credits, um, typically 25 years for a sequestration project. And sequestration is a fancy way of saying storage. <clears throat> and most of your um, most of the projects that we've been discussing and probably will be discussing today are sequestration projects. But happy to go into that in more detail if it's relevant. Permanence period is really the period over which the carbon has to stay stored in the ground, and, and Dean touched on that as well, that um, you can't have carbon being stored in vegetation and soils and, and trees and other things, only to then let it out and have leakage um, in, in other areas. So the Act and the framework sets up a requirement for nominating either a 25-year period that you'll keep um, the carbon stores and, and pool in the ground, in the biomass, uh, or a 100-year period, um, and there's some price and, and carbon credit differences potentially between those two options, uh, depending on what you'd like to do and also what you can do um, under, the, under the tenure or leases that you hold. Um, there needs to be the identification of a project area, and interestingly, the, the discussion that Dean mentioned around carbon uh, estimation areas and how many of them you might have on a, on a property it's sort of called stratification. So you, you start with a project area, which is the overall area that you'll be conducting your project within, and then that gets broken into estimation areas, um, and they can they can be stratified on advice of your of your ecologists and the people helping you um, to set up a carbon project. But looking at getting the most out of the project area, as well as identifying the project area, because it's it's actually incredibly important because of some of the notification requirements under the Act, and particularly if there are either um, conduct or natural disturbance activities that occur and lead to a loss of carbon that's stored, um, there's notification and potentially relinquishment obligations attached to the, the project area as a whole, um, which are sometimes informed by the carbon estimation areas, but the, the project area is really the pivotal test for some of those notification requirements and, and relinquishment requirements. And so that's that's important, um, and, and again, I think that's an area where we're learning by doing. It, it makes more logic and sense for it to actually be, if you're storing carbon, it should be where the carbon's released rather than the project area as a whole. However, again, this is part of the clunky fit of trying to trying to keep up and match um, things, particularly that are modelled, um, with real-world measurements and, and examples of, of loss and, and incidents that can occur. So just to very briefly touch on... Um, that some of these key concepts, um, I, I don't want to go into them all in too much detail, but a project proponent, as I mentioned, is the person, and this comes from the Act, who is responsible for carrying out the project and has the legal right to do it. Um, and that's important because the legal right comes back to the raft of interests, making sure you've got appropriate access, that your, that your access or your rights to be on, on the land that you're on um, are sufficient to enable you to do what it is that you're saying you want to do. Um, with that and, and with looking at, at tenure and the land interests um, comes the concept of an eligible interest holder. 
And um, again, this is important and I always encourage people to look at it early because they're basically people who hold a legal or equitable interest in the land and that can be um, in, in some circumstances if it's a freehold property that's being leased and the lessee is undertaking the, the project, um, the freehold owner would be uh, an eligible interest holder. Um, similarly, for Crown land and pastoral leases, the Crown land minister is an eligible interest holder. Um, banks are eligible interest holders. So if you if you do have a mortgage um, attaching to the land that you want to do a project on, um, the bank is an eligible interest holder. And there's a bit of a mixed there's a bit of a mixed response at the moment with banks. Some banks are viewing carbon projects in a very progressive way, and understanding that they improve the productivity and, and sustainability of a lot of farming practices and see it as an asset. Um, other banks, for reasons that we'll get to shortly, are seeing it as a potential restriction or encumbrance um, on the productivity of the of the, of the um, property. So there's a, a mixed response, and I'd encourage you, depending on who you bank with, to, to shop around and see um, how you go or to have those conversations early because you'll, you'll realise very quickly how difficult or how long it might take to, to get those consents. Um, again, engaging early with any determined native title holders. So native title holders have an eligible interest um, in, in areas and if you want to do a carbon project on an area where native title has been determined to exist, you need to get the consent of the native title holders, um, particularly the prescribed body corporate uh, that holds the native title on behalf of, of people um, under a native title determination. So again, engaging early is certainly um, important there in order to to have that have discussions early and factor that into your into your carbon project. Um, I mentioned before some of these concepts, so accrediting period and the permanence period, as well as relinquishment and carbon maintenance obligations. So I won't I won't go through accrediting period and permanence period again um, because I mentioned them earlier and we can touch on them if there are questions later. Um, but basically, your your permanence obligations require you to hold the carbon and to maintain carbon um, that's stored in the country, maintain it in the country. So um, if there are, if there is a loss, um, so if carbon that's stored in the, in the project land is lost, either due to unavoidable natural disturbance, a fire or something, um, or deliberate conduct, um, there are circumstances in which the regulator can require a project proponent to relinquish um, carbon credits to reflect that loss. Of, of storage. So again, that's why it's important to identify who the who the project proponent is. And in looking at it, if you're looking at developing projects um, with a carbon project developer, and there are some models where the developers actually like to be the project proponent, make sure you think about and, and talk about and then get clarity and agreements around what happens in some of these circumstances. Um, whether you both share in the in the ups and downs or whether or not there are certain things that um, the, the developer or yourself take on as the risk or potential liability. So if there is a relinquishment requirement, um, so if there is an incident and carbon is lost um, from, from an area in which it's been stored and there is a requirement to relinquish credits or to give back credits um, to the reg regulator, if there's either non-compliance with that or it looks like there will be non-compliance with that and, and that the re relinquishment requirement won't be met, um, the regulator can actually put in place what's called a carbon maintenance declaration um, or carbon maintenance obligation. They can declare a project um, to be subject to a CMO or a carbon maintenance obligation and basically that sets a, a benchmark level of carbon that needs to be maintained in the country and it, and it binds anyone with an interest in that property uh, to comply with that. And it, it may allow certain activities. It, it certainly is intended to allow standard activities to continue to, to be undertaken, provided they're not going to interfere with that carbon store that's required to be maintained. Um, now, the, the important part of that, and, and it links back to why you need eligible interest holder consent, is that it, it can affect people who had nothing to do with the project. Um, so a future purchaser, if, if land is sold and someone else buys it, um, they can be bound to follow one of these carbon maintenance obligations and because of the ability to, to permit or to restrict activities on the land to protect the carbon store, um, it, it also has implications for native title holders and farmers and others, um, you know, if you sublease a property as well. So that's, again, something to be aware of um, when you're looking at 
looking at entering into these projects. Um, I, I reckon we're almost halfway there, so I'm going to head into some of the practical considerations, and I'm, I'm noting I need to need to wrap up. Hi, Emily. Um, Sorry. In about sort of 15 oh. minutes. Yep. Yeah, that's my 15-minute check-in for you, so thank yep. you. Yeah, good. All right. <laughs> Thanks. Cheers. Um, what I've got on this slide um, is really trying to summarise what I've what I've said in a little bit of technical jargon uh, more clearly. I think lawyers should always be forced to, to communicate with diagrams um, because it does help to try and simplify some concepts. So really when you're looking at a project, um, there's a few things to check from your legal perspective. Uh, in addition to the feasibility and, and certainly some of the work that Dean and, and his team do, looking at the location and the condition of land, um, the movement of stock and how you might modify activities to, to fit with the method or improve methods um, and sequester land and, and what the potential is for a carbon project. Um, the other lens that's incredibly important to put to these things is looking at land tenure and the legal rights associated with the right to carry out a project. So that involves looking at regulatory consents that you might need. Um, there's a regulatory uh, angle to testing of projects as well. Land tenure, making sure that you can access and do what it is that you're wanting to do on land or if you're conveying that to someone else that that's done properly, um, as well as securing eligible interest holder consents that you need. Um, and then also looking at operation and delivery, which we'll get to shortly, um, and the, the type of method the type of project that you're going to engage in and the method that applies to that um, as well. So human-induced re regeneration is one example of those. Buying and selling ACCUs will we'll come to as well, but on eligible interest holder consents, um, I mean, some of the some of the questions to, to look at here are who owns the land and who has uh, interests that are registered on the land. Um, and I think sort of title searching and those sorts of things, checking to see if there's native title determinations. What I've put on this slide for you at the moment is that you can see um, much of South Australia, including in the far north, is covered uh, either by APY lands or also non-exclusive native title determinations. So there's a high likelihood that um, native title exists in areas that you might be looking at projects and therefore looking at that, working out who you need to contact and getting in touch with um, eligible interest holders early in your in your thought process helps structure and plan the project um, with the greatest efficiency. Um, Crown leases and pastoral leases, which I know are topical, uh, again, looking at what's permitted and not permitted under the lease, and, and that comes back also to mandatory conditions and mandatory reservations under the lease back to the Crown. When you, when you need pastoral board approval um, and, and being timely about getting that, um, and covering off on, on any review and changes that are coming, which no doubt um, friends and colleagues in the, in the government might cover off on or, or will certainly be keeping you up to date with as things progress there from the bill that was released. Um, the, other, the other figure that I've got up there shows you um, roughly, as it sort of earlier this week, um, the number of projects and, and carbon credits that have been issued in South Australia and the generally the type of project. So you can see that there's um, quite a few vegetation type projects um, and a few agricultural projects as well as closer into Adelaide and urban areas, some, um, some landfill and waste projects as well. Looking at mapping out and, um, and, and how some of these key concepts come together, um, I, I, this slide's really intended to show you how some of these things fit together sequentially and therefore how you might approach a project. Um, Pre-registration, the need to go through some of the things we've talked about, feasibility, your due diligence on your property, um, getting estimates as to what your carbon yield might be, whether it's going to be worthwhile to, to do a project or if it's marginal and, and it might you might be motivated to do a project for any number of reasons, including uh, biodiversity and, and other general productivity reasons um, and looking to identify and engage with your eligible interest holders early. So that dotted blue line is really looking at a, a pre-registration phase. Um, there is an overlap in that you can apply to have a project registered on a conditional basis, which means that you still need to satisfy conditions like obtaining consents that you haven't yet obtained when you apply to register a project before the end of your first reporting period. And really that's before um, the period in which you're going to report on your activities and apply for, for carbon credits. So essentially, if, if you do proceed and get a, a project conditionally registered, 
um, you won't be able to receive carbon credits until you've satisfied those conditions. So it, it can be done and sometimes it's useful because then you have security that you've got a project up, you know you can do it, um, but you still need to get these consents in place. Um, if you're negotiating delivery contracts, so sale contracts in parallel, um, certainly it's useful to carry those conditions through as conditions on your sale contract so you don't get yourself into a sticky corner and commit to delivering things that you don't yet have um, or at least assess your confidence and risk around some of those things at the outset. Um, but again, it can be it can be useful to do that because then you have certainty of, of knowing that you you can if you if you get those consents you can deliver projects that might give you more um, more confidence to discuss how payments and 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 um, benefit distribution might work in order to get some of those consents up front. The crediting period so the period in which you can apply to get credits starts when the project's registered. Um, so if your conditional registration eats into that, it eats into it. Um, but your reporting period is, is uh, a little bit up to you. There's, there's rules around how soon it can be and how late it can be, um, but otherwise there's some flexibility around how often you report um, and you can, you can talk to the regulator about that and they will, they will agree on, on when you should be reporting and that will be formalised in declarations as well. As shown here, your permanence period can either be the same as your crediting period, 25 years, or it can be longer, um, 100 years. So you... You apply and you receive credits and you, you get the thing that you can sell and trade um, in 25 over a 25-year period. Um, it's not linear. I'm sure Dean will explain to you that vegetation grows and you all know, um, working on the land as well, that vegetation grows at different rates in different areas um, and therefore there'll be all sorts of curves associated with the yield, um, the growth of vegetation, the measurement, um, the sequestration and storage of carbon and therefore how many units you, you generate over that period and, and whether that comes in peaks and troughs and all manner of curves. Uh, but bearing in mind then that if, if your project does involve fencing and other maintenance of, of infrastructure, it is less intensive, the reporting and maintenance obligations over the longer term, but um, there will continue to be maintenance obligations and, and that permanence obligation stretching for 100 years. So... Um, that includes, you know, the requirement to keep up fences and, and weeds and ferals and all those sorts of things. So really splitting it into three phases, planning, operating and managing projects and then managing your carbon stores is, is one way to think about this. Um, Agreement-wise, so looking at um, agreements and project engaging with project developers, it often occurs in the planning stage. So there might be service agreements. Some developers like you to sign up to exclusivity for both the feasibility of a project and then its registration and operation. So depending on who you're talking to and what you're talking about, um, your agreements might cover both the planning and the operating and managing stages, or you might want to break it into these sorts of sequential parts where you're looking at upfront planning before you make a decision and not locking yourself in um, to get your feasibility assessments and, and paying for that fee-for-service type advice as well as getting your eligible interest identified and dealt with. Um, looking at your tenure and, and carbon rights and engaging with other eligible interest holders, including native title holders early, um, and, and contracting the help that you need during that planning and feasibility process. Um, if you roll it together with operating and managing it, um, there might be concepts like agents that pop up, um, and agents can be, they're recognised under the Act, we will always encourage people, if, you, if you're appointing an agent, to think about potentially a side agreement that deals with um, how that agent behaves and, and how you can and can't terminate that. Um, sometimes for simplicity, agent provisions are thrown into carbon uh, project development agreements and, and the service provider or the, the carbon developer will also act as your agent and it's, it's in, important to carefully look at those provisions to make sure you're comfortable with, with what they'll be doing. Um, as well as the, the types of services that they'll be providing to you. Um, the stages and timing of obligations. So there's, there's different milestones um, and also looking at pricing and, and how, how payments might work. Um, some of this, as Dean mentioned earlier, the spot price um, from OMF and, and others, that spot price related to carbon credits only. And increasingly now there are ways to... Um, to attract buyers based on co-benefits. So some of the other benefits that these 
projects can deliver either to the environment or to Indigenous groups, to traditional owners as well as to communities more broadly. If they're, if they're measurable and quantifiable or describable, um, a lot of uh, certainly companies are looking at paying a premium for them as well as some of the example funds that are popping up by other governments like the Land Restoration Fund in Queensland and um, there's other governments looking at doing the same thing. So really encouraging those co-benefits and actually paying a premium for co-benefits on top of the carbon credit, which, which makes good sense for everybody. But I guess in the agreements, making sure that you know what's being sold and, and how any payments that you receive, if you're not actually the project proponent, um, will come back to you, whether it's just as one revenue stream as a, as a percentage of overall or whether you, you do look at splitting out prices and, and floor prices and uplifts and, and these things can become um, remarkably detailed depending on what it is that you want to do. Uh, there's ease in, ease in keeping it simple and there's, there's, there's benefits in keeping it simple but there's also um, the need to closely inspect sometimes what are very simple arrangements to make sure they work for you. Also important to talk about what happens in the longer term um, project proponent who's going to be responsible for risks, relinquishment requirements and, and particularly being aware of the possibility of carbon maintenance obligations in the long term as well. I think we're, I'm probably coming up on, on time, but um, a couple of things that I, I did want to quickly mention towards the end is um, in working out who's doing what and, and payment structures, it's important to look at um, initial outlays, payment milestones and approaches and, and delivery risk. Um, if there are shortfalls, if you're contracted to deliver things that you don't deliver, there's breach of contract issues. Um, there's also potential um, ways, and I think your contracts with project developers needs to sort, sort through some of these issues and document them in terms of um, if there are those contractual shortfalls, but also if your estimates are, are under. And they can be under because of um, you know, various inadvertent errors in, in looking at these things. As Dean mentioned, most people tend to be conservative because you minimise the risk of that, but they can also be under because of environmental or, or climactic reasons as well. You have a good or a bad year and therefore your, your yield is is not as good. So looking at what you agree to deliver, so how many carbon credits you agree to deliver to someone, um, you, need to, you need to look into some of those risks and shortfalls and ensure that you have a level of confidence. Otherwise, you'll have to go and buy from the market to top up um, and deliver on ACUs depending on the terms of your contract to ensure that that um, gets met and, and that can have cost in implications for you. We've talked about some of those concepts. There's um, the slides um, I've got in PDF form and I'm, I'm comfortable for them to be circulated and some of this information was included um, for those reasons. This provides an overview of the types of carbon markets operating in Australia and includes renewable energy markets as well. And the, the clean energy regulators now got quite a lot of sophisticated and interesting information on it um, <clears throat> in relation to the market. And what I've extracted on this slide from the clean energy regulator is sort of a historic snapshot of the um, of the carbon price um, and and talking about I, I couldn't help myself whenever I think of going to market I do think of of little piggies and um, going to markets <laughs> excuse the, the slide there but um, I think I think brokers and the role of brokers is really to buy and sell and they're increasingly being used by some of those companies with a high um, heavy emitters who have high emissions and need to need to buy credits either to fulfil compliance obligations um, or because of branding and carbon neutrality commitments. And brokers are exactly that. They're, they're people who sit in the middle and buy and sell um, credits uh, to and from. You need to make sure they've got um, financial services licensing and accreditation if you're dealing with brokers and if you're seeking advice on, on the price of credits, um, ensure that you're dealing with people that have that. The, Carbon Industry Code of Conduct, which was on the screen before, is, is a useful thing to look at. Google the people that are coming to you and talking about it. I note that Select Carbon and Dean are founding signatories of the Carbon Industry Code of Conduct, so they're up front helping ensure that the carbon um, industry continues to have the integrity it has. But make sure, if you're not sure of who you're talking to, hop onto Google. It can be your friend and, and check and ask whether or not they're signatories 
to the code and, and Emily, the code sets out. Can I, can I, yep. sorry, I'm going to jump in. Um, yep. I'm just really conscious no, of the time and I actually had one of my questions on the list to talk about that code of conduct. So um, I, might, no, um, I might, if it's of, uh, opportunity to jump in and sorry to interrupt you and stop you there, but um, we will no have plenty of opportunity to talk. I'm going to invite uh, Bill McIntosh uh, back, but we are going to take a break. Um, I'm just going to uh, flag the fact that we can't go out the front door here.